Hello, everyone, and welcome to our discussion of David Koresh and the Waco Siege. My name is Misty Wilson-Mertens, and I am the Department Chair for the History, Government, and Sociology classes at the Connect Campus. We're excited to have you join us today for this discussion. Before we get started, I want to thank the committee that helped make this possible, and especially Dr. Chloe Northrup, who helped set all this up. I would also like to direct your attention to the chat feature. You can enter your questions here for the speaker, and then we'll answer the end as we have time. Sorry about that, guys. I'm hearing a feedback loop. Um, so joining us today is going to be Professor Stacy Bryant. Professor Bryant has been a full time professor at the Connect campus for about a year, and we are so excited to hear her presentation. So the Waco siege raised a lot of questions, both nationally and at the state level, about guns, trafficking, and then also about child marriage. In addition to that, the siege raised questions about government intervention and possibly government overstep. So we're gonna address a lot of those questions today. All right, so welcome Professor Stacy Bryant. Thank you so much, and I'm excited to be here today. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining us today. I know this is a very busy time during the semester, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to have this conversation. Um, we are currently in the 30th anniversary of the siege at Waco that occurred from February 28th until April 19th, 1993. This is the longest standoff that occurred during American history, and it resulted in the deaths of 86 people. So this event generated quite a bit of mistrust in the federal government. Um, Waco became a symbol for anti-government militias and conspiracy theorists. It also um, was a motivator and factor for some actions of domestic terrorists. Um, and then also some of the lessons that we learned during this strategy have been used to influence new and updated uh, federal policies. So today we're going to discuss the origins of the Branch Davidian Church and how this developed over the decades. We're also going to talk about David Koresh, um, who he was as a person, and then his leadership of the Branch Davidians. We will be discussing what happened during the siege and some of the critical missteps that occurred before finally talking about the impact and the aftermath of this event. The Branch Davidians were established in the 1920s, but they were heavily influenced by a religious leader in the 19th century named Cyrus Teed. Now, Teed served as a doctor during the Civil War, and he studied science, religion, and alchemy uh, before he established the Koreshian Unity Church. Uh, during one of his alchemy experiments, he actually electrocuted himself and fell unconscious. And then when he woke up, he believed that God had revealed a message to him, and that's when he established this church. Um, and it also was a religious commune where people lived together in Estero, Florida. So Teed gained several hundred followers over the decades that followed um, during this church, and he published a magazine called The Flaming Sword that outlined a lot of his teachings. So some of his teachings were that the Messiah or Christ had come to earth multiple times, and he was going to be the seventh and final incarnation of the Messiah. Um, he taught that the he was the Latter-day David or the king over God's people. He taught that he was the sinful Messiah. And this meant that um, there were some previous incarnations where the Messiah was sinless, but he himself was not. Uh, and he also taught that the book of Revelation in the Bible prophesied him being the person who could open the seven seals. And he discussed the need for his followers to be celibate and live on his communal property. Now in 1906, this property was actually raided and the Koreshian people were physically assaulted. Um, Cyrus T received a pretty serious head wound and he died from complications of that wound two years later in 1908. Uh, in 1971, the Koreshian Foundation published their teachings uh, called Koreshianity, a New Age Religion. 
And this book was not widely circulated at all, but there was a copy of this book in the Waco Public Library. The Branch Davidian Church was officially established in 1930, and this was an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the 1920s, a man named Victor Hutaf developed his own interpretation of Adventist beliefs. Um, he published these teachings in a two-part series called The Shepherd's Rod. And these books called for reformation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, listed new interpretations of the prophetic statements that happened in the Bible. It explained some of his beliefs that the physical kingdom of God would be established in Palestine um, shortly before Judgment Day. So in 1935, he and a group of his followers uh, purchased land right outside of Waco to establish a small agrarian community. And they called this location Mount Carmel, which was named after a sacred site in Israel. Uh, the community consisted of simple homes that housed individual families. Um, Victor Hutef died in 1955, and his wife Florence stepped into the leadership position. Now, Florence continued to teach about signs of the end times and cover a lot of his teachings, but she went one step further, or some might say several steps further, because she prophesied that her husband would be resurrected on April 22nd, 1959, and that this would be the first step in establishing the kingdom of God on earth. Now, approximately 1,000 followers gathered at Mount Carmel to witness this event, and when it didn't come true, she was questioned as the leader and the prophet over this group. Ben Roden was a follower of Victor and Florence, and he replaced Florence as the leader of the Branch Davidians in 1959. Ben Roden believed that he was a prophet and had direct communication with God. He believed that it was important that the Seventh-day Adventist uh, focus on the end times prophecy and established a community in Israel. His wife Lotus, or, I'm sorry, Lois, assumed her leadership position after her husband died in 1978. So while she was also focused on the end times prophecies, she took another significant step outside of the branch tra uh, Davidian traditions. Um, she taught that the Holy Spirit was feminine, and this had been revealed to her by God. She established a, a new magazine called the Shekinah Magazine, and that gave a voice to feminist issues within the church, and it also advocated for a more gender-inclusive translation of the Bible. She traveled internationally and became fairly well-known speaking about this topic around the world. Lois helped to lay the foundation for apocalyptic beliefs among the branch Davidians who were involved in the 1993 siege. She taught that the Mount Carmel Center near Waco was the New Jerusalem, and that all of the believers who were present would have to pass through a baptism of fire as a cleansing gateway to enter the kingdom of heaven. Lois's beliefs were heavily influenced by the writings of Cyrus Teed, and she passed these teachings on to her protege, Vernon Howell, um, who went by the name of David Koresh. Ben and Lois had a son named George, Roden, and he was designated to be their successor at the end of um, his father's life. In 1986, in 1986, Lois Roden died of cancer, and this caused conflict among Branch Davidians because David Koresh had recently moved into the compound in 1981, and he had actually established a romantic relationship with, Lo with Lois, despite there being over a 40 age difference in their age. So the two of them started to tell their followers that she was going to conceive a son with him and that that was going to be the chosen one. That did not sit very well with George Roden, who was at this point around 45 years old, and uh, was had currently been the chosen one and the person designated to replace his father. So in 1986, there was quite a bit of conflict. Um, when she passed away, uh, David Koresh had moved with a group of his followers to Palestine, Texas, and George Roden took over the community at Mount Carmel. He called the center uh, Rodenville and were actually driving people off of the location um, at gunpoint to keep people away. So in 1987, there was quite a bit of conflict when she died because a lot of the people at Mount Carmel Center remembered that David was designated to be the successor. And so um, what he decided was that he challenged David to a contest to determine the true prophet. And he said that the true prophet would be able to resurrect someone from the dead. Uh, his plan for this was that he was going to exhume a grave from a, that existed on the site 
and both would attempt to resurrect this person and whoever did not successfully resurrect the person could not be the prophet and would need to leave permanently. Um, David Koresh decided that he was not going to participate in this experiment and he actually contacted the sheriff's department. Now, this story was a pretty, um, it sounded like a tall tale, it didn't really sound very accurate. So they said that they couldn't take any action on it without evidence. And then, um, so David Koresh and some of his followers tried to, decided to go out and get evidence. They took cameras and tried to take some pictures of the skeletal remains and the um, coffin that had been removed from the graveyard. A gunfight broke out and that resulted in George Roden being shot in the hand and David Koresh was uh, charged with attempted murder at that point in time. So that sounds like it might be the end of the story, but it actually continued to get even stranger from there. So when he, um, after he was released on jail, George Roden became furious with the judge. Um, he started a letter writing campaign where he attempted to curse him with AIDS and herpes. Um, George was found to be in contempt of court and was sentenced to six months in jail. So while he was in jail, David returned to the compound and he paid all of the back taxes, which came out to about $60,000. He updated all of the utility bills, got everything working on the property again, and basically resumed ownership of the property. George was released from jail in 1988, and he successfully started, a, he tried to restart his campaign against David, uh, but then the following year, he actually murdered a man named Dale Adair and spent the rest of his life in a mental institution. So at this point, David was in firm control over Mount Carmel, and his followers came from all walks of life. There were people from the United States, Canada, Israel, and the UK. There were people from the Philippines and New Zealand. Um, his followers included theologians, postal workers, businessmen, and musicians. Uh, and life was very challenging for this group of people. So Mount Carmel was originally consisted of a community of cabins, but David directed his followers to disassemble those individual houses and build up one large structure called the Ant Hill. And that's what's seen in most of these photos. This building did not have any restrooms and the um, residents had to use outhouses and they showered with water hoses outdoors. The building was uninsulated, so it was very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. Life at Mount Carmel was referred to as the withering experience because it was intentionally difficult for the followers. Every aspect of their life, uh, ranging from personal appearances to individual purchases to their diets, were strictly controlled by Koresh. Uh, it was an intentional strategy to keep these people isolated and to focus exclusively on his teachings. Corporal punishment at Mount Carmel began when children reached about eight months of age. Multiple witnesses recalled witnessing spankings of children that drew blood on infants and toddlers. Children who lived on the compound remembered experiencing this almost every day. Um, one of the survivors named Joanne Vega was six years old when she left Mount Carmel, and she remembered that she was spanked on a daily basis, that there was nothing she could do right and nothing that she could do good enough. Um, her exact words were, you're just raised with fear, everywhere is fear. Uh, while these children received most of the corporal punishment, Koresh also spanked adults who stepped out of line. The federal government, outside friends, and the world outside of the Branch Davidian Church was referred to as Babylon. Uh, Babylon was the embodiment of evil and was the enemy who, which they would fight on the final battle. Everyone had a role to play in this community. Some people worked outside of the commune and shared their salary with the community. Other people um, supported the community through construction work or providing childcare. The Branch Davidians also had several business ventures that they used to support themselves. They operated a thriving gun business um, at gun shows. They bred and sold Alaskan Malamute dogs. The Branch Davidians also had a music production business and a recording studio. There were one to three Bible studies each day, and um, sometimes these lasted until the early hours of the morning. In 1987, David began to teach that God commanded him to have as many children as possible and allowed him to marry up to 140 women. Now, David chose some very young wives. His first wife and his only legal wife, um, her name was Rachel, and he married her when she was 14 years old. The first spiritual wife that he chose was Rachel's 12-year-old sister. Um, David referred to people who he chose as spiritual wives as being in the house of David. 
Um, he also said that these women and girls were chosen by God to have a baby for God. So in Texas, the legal age of consent is 17, um, but at this point in time, minors were able to get married as young as 12. Now I know we can't have a uh, conversation about this, but if you want to think to yourself what you think the legal age of marriage is now, um, it's actually still 14. So the, you can get married at the age of 14 with parental consent. So the first person that he chose as a spiritual wife was 12-year-old Michelle Jones, who was his wife, Rachel's younger sister. Now, in total, David had an estimated 19 spiritual wives in addition to his one legal wife. The majority of these girls were under the age of consent. So to protect himself from allegations of statutory rape, he arranged for legal marriages between the girls who were ages 14 to 16 to men who were within the group. This led the midwives who were delivering babies to believe that the pregnancies were the result of legal marriages instead of the result of statutory rape. Now, three of these girls that he considered to be his um, spiritual wives were under the age of 14, and the youngest was 10 years old. Uh, their pregnancies and deliveries were attended by a midwife, but she did not report any of these for suspected abuse. One of his followers named David Thibodeau uh, believed that he might have intentionally married some of these younger girls to attract the attention of authorities. In a sermon that he recorded on August of 1987, Koresh explained to his followers that he would ultimately be killed by authorities because of his wives. The Branch Davidians had an affinity for guns and they operated a profitable gun business that helped meet the financial needs of their community. Um, a Branch Davidian named Paul Fata frequently worked as a vendor at gun shows on a regular basis. Um, he sold gear, survival supplies, and even David Koresh branded magazine vests. They worked with a Fort Worth gun dealer named Henry McMahon to amass an arsenal of guns, military gear, ammunition, and grenade holds for the Mount Carmel Center. David always explained that the purpose of these weapons was to protect the children at Mount Carmel. In May of 1992, a UPS driver contacted the McLennan County Sheriff's Department because the Branch Davidians were receiving regular shipments of military gear, gun parts, ammunition, grenade holes, and chemicals to the Mount Carmel Center. The Sheriff's Department contacted the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, uh, more commonly known as ATF, to investigate this. So the ATF conducted interviews of former Branch Davidians and firearms de dealers. They also reviewed documentation um, that showed the purchases of semi-automatic weapons, um, inert grenades, and they also looked at the shipping manifests. The ATF discovered that the Branch Davidians were converting semi-automatic weapons into fully automatic weapons uh, and also creating live grenades in both of which would be illegal. So on February 28, 1993, the ATF attempted to execute a search warrant of Mount Carmel. The Davidians were tipped off that this was going to happen uh, when a lost reporter asked a postal worker for directions and this postal worker happened to be a Branch Davidian. Um, so he went straight back to the compound and warned David Koresh, who realized that there had been an undercover agent with them the entire time. Um, this undercover agent's name was Robert Rodriguez, and at that point his cover was blown. He turned to him and said, we know they're on their way, and Rodriguez attempted to call off the raid. So he went back to warn the ATF commander. He told them that they knew that their cover had been blown and that they knew that the raid was imminent. Um, but he was not successful in calling off this raid. Helicopters were used as an aerial distraction while over 100 ATF agents stormed Mount Carmel. Eyewitness accounts differ on who fired the first shot. Of course, both sides believe that the other side was the first to fire the shot. Um, but several of the witnesses believe that the very first shots came from a team who were assigned to kill the dogs at Mount Carmel. Um, and then a gunfight quickly ensued. So within the first minute of the gunfight, a Davidian named Date Wayne Martin called 911 asking for a ceasefire and explaining that there were women and children being shot and killed. Um, David Koresh was shot in the hand and the stomach. Over the next two hours, four ATF agents were killed and about 20 were wounded. Six branch Davidians were also killed. The county sheriff negotiated a, six, a ceasefire agreement and the ATF uh, retreated at that point. An ATF agent named Jim Cavanaugh described the chaos of the event. 
when he said that he had a radio mic in one ear with an agent pleading for his life, and on the other ear, he was on the phone with someone who believed he was God. The FBI replaced the ATF in the standoff, and the FBI's hostage rescue team established open lines of communication with the, the Davidians. There was also a tactical team that worked along with the hostage negotiation team, but they were commonly at odds with each other. They both had independent goals that they were working against each other to try to achieve, and the negotiators believed that the tactical team um, were, was really counterproductive in what they were trying to accomplish. So on March 1st, the hostage negotiation team facilitated the release of 10 children from Mount Carmel. Then the FBI's tactical team deployed armored vehicles around the perimeter of Mount Carmel and cut the phone access for anyone except for um, the FBI. So David Koresh became very agitated at this point and the progress stalled. On March 2nd, Koresh made a one hour recording of a sermon and he agreed to surrender if that sermon was played on a national broadcast. The Christian Broadcast Network played that tape at 11.30 p.m. on March 2nd, and then at around, I'm sorry, 1.30 p.m. on March 2nd. Around 6 p.m., Koresh told the negotiators that God had told him to wait and not surrender at this point in time. A couple days later on March 4th, the FBI psychological profilers warned that increasing tactical presence at Mount Carmel would be counterproductive and that it could possibly result in additional loss of life. Now, despite this warning, the tactical team continued to increase the pressure. The following day, a child was released from the compound and this little girl had a note pinned to her jacket. Uh, the note explained was from her mother and explained that once the final children had left the compound, that all of the adults would die. So after receiving the note, the FBI asked for guidance from former Davidians and experts about the likelihood of mass suicide occurring at this compound. Uh, they were provided with inconsistent answers and the tactical pressure continued to increase. On March 8th, the FBI delivered milk to the compound and the packaging was bugged with listening devices. The following day, electricity and water was cut to the compound. It was repeatedly restored and cut off at multiple points over the following days and it's in an attempt to pressure the Davidians to leave. On March 12th, the utilities were permanently cut to the building and the tactical team started to use sleep deprivation techniques. So they used floodlights inside all of the windows and would blare loud music, trying to prevent sleep and pressure the Davidians to leave the compound. On March 29th, a lawyer met with David Koresh and they agreed to surrender after the Passover, which would fall April 5th through 12th. On April 10th, the FBI surrounded the compound with wire. On the 14th, the crash told the FBI that he would surrender after he wrote a manuscript explaining the seven seals. Two days later, on the 16th, U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno was asked for permission to use tear gas at the compound, but she rejected that request. Koresh said that he completed the first manuscript of the seven seals and needed to work on manuscripts two through seven. On the 17th, Janet Reno later approved the use of tear gas because she was told that children were being abused inside the compound. The following day, Davidians were seen holding children up in the window so that they could be seen by the FBI. Um, and in another window, they held up a sign that said flames await. The siege came to a tragic end on the following day, which was April 19th. At 6 a.m., the Davidians were told they were under arrest and that they would be driven out of the property with tear gas. Uh, holes were punched into the sides of the building to insert gas and create additional exit routes. By 11.45 a.m., the structure was destabilized and one of the walls actually collapsed and fell down. And within 15 minutes of that, fire started at three separate locations around the building. Nine people escaped and 76 people were killed in the fire, and that includes 25 children. The topic of who started the fire at the Ant Hill building has been a topic of speculation and debate for the last 30 years. Um, it's also been the subject of several conspiracy theories that um, some people actually claim that the United States used flamethrowers against the building. All evidence supports the fact that the Branch Davidians intentionally set these fires to fulfill the prophecy. Um, in the weeks fire, prior to the fire, a psychiatrist named Dr. Bruce Perry was working with some of the children who had been released from the compound at Mount Carmel. And several of these children were drawing pictures that appeared to show the Ant Hill building in flames. 
when he asked the children to tell him about the pictures, they would respond by either telling him that it was none of his business or that he would find out soon enough. He passed this information on to the FBI. On April 18th, um, like we mentioned earlier, there were ominous signs of the Branch Davidians holding up signs saying fire awaits in the windows. And then also later that day, um, Steve Snyder, who was David Koresh's second in command, reported uh, was reported making jokes about the people becoming charcoal briquettes. The following morning, there's another recording of him telling people to spread fuel around the building. And one of the followers asking for clarification, saying we only light if they come in, right? Um, so that's a pretty uh, conclusive evidence that they did, in fact, start these fires. A Swedish team of investigators who were not affiliated with the FBI or the ATF came in to investigate um, the, the source of the fire as well. They found the source of the fire to be kerosene lamps that had been cut open with knives um, located in different areas of the building. Only nine of the 84 people inside the building escaped this fire, and there were probably very few who were involved with lighting it. So most people do not believe that the people who survived the fire were actually involved with starting it. A hostage negotiator named Gary Nosner, who retired from the FBI, describes Waco as a self-inflicted wound to the Bureau. It contributed to anti-government sentiment, it sparked a dramatic rise in conspiracy theorists, anti-government militias, and it's even been used as justification for acts of terrorism. Michael German was an undercover FBI agent who infiltrated militia groups, um, and he said that he rarely met any militia members who did not identify Waco as their reason for joining the militia. He explained that militias are now blending with QAnon conspiracy theorists, and um, it's really starting to get out of control as far as some of the things that people are believing is um, with certain groups of the country being child abusing predators. Katrina Doxy with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington explained why Waco is such an effective example for these groups. Um, basically, the narrative is that Waco is very relatable because the government was willing to kill children to take away their guns. Alex Jones is a conspiracy theorist and a radio show host. He um, established multiple websites, including Infowars, News Wars, and Prison Planet, that spreads uh, fake news and misinformation about conspiracy theories. Jones was a high school senior when the siege at Waco took place, and it had a profound impact on his views of the federal government. Um, he believed that this could happen to any of anyone in the country. So he shares his conspiracy theories that the Sandy Cook shooting was a hoax, that September 11th was an inside job, and he even teaches that the government can harness weather and create disasters such as tornadoes and floods to use as weapons against the American people. Um, he teaches that the Clintons run a child trafficking ring out of a pizza parlor. So he has a very large following. Uh, his website has about 10 million viewers each month, and his YouTube channels attract about 17 million viewers each month. Anti-government militias are believed that the federal government is a tyrannical group. And these groups basically exist to intimidate and to spread fear about conspiracy theories. Some of the largest groups uh, include the American Patriot, 3%, the American States Assemblies, the Constitution Party, Oath Keepers, Patriots for America, and We Are Change. Nearly all of these groups cite their reason for existence as the um, waste siege at Waco. On April 19th, 1995, um, marked the two year anniversary of the fire at Waco. And at this point, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols bombed the Alfred Free P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City as retaliation against this siege. Uh, the location for this building was chosen because it housed the ATF and the FBI. At least 186 people, including 19 children, were killed in this attack. 680 more people were injured, and the bombing damaged 324 buildings. The siege at Waco was again cited as justification in the riots for the, uh, on January 6, 2021, where two to 3,000 Trump supporters stormed the Capitol building, hoping to prevent Joe Biden from becoming president. They physically assaulted police officers, 
urinated and defecated in Democrats offices, chained, uh, chanted hang Mike Pence when he refused to declare that Trump was still president. One writer even placed pipe bombs outside of the Democratic National Committee, but those palms were discovered and disabled before they were detonated. Um, a concerning discovery here was that the majority of these rioters were fully engaged members of society, and that indicates that these beliefs have really infiltrated and spread to a wider portion of, the, of society than what we had realized. Um, over half of the people who were arrested on that day were lawyers, doctors, architects, and business owners. 20% were military veterans, and only 13% were militia members or members of extremist groups. <clears throat> um, so as far as the Branch Davidians today are concerned, several of the survivors remained in Waco after the siege, and they stayed in contact with each other. Most had traditional lives, but a few of the um, survivors, including David Thibodeau and Clive Goyle, became speakers. They were often asked to speak at different militia event events. Both men explained that militia members would become confrontational and accuse them of having chips implanted in their brain if they tried to correct any misinformation, such as um, some of the conspiracy theories about flamethrowers. Alex Jones paid to have the Branch Davidians Chapel at Mount Carmel rebuilt. The current pastor was a member of this church in the 1980s, but he left during the period that George Roden controlled the compound. He considers the siege um, survivors to be apostates, so they are not members of the current congregation. There are currently about two dozen members of this congregation who attend Sabbath services there and several thousand um, scattered across the, the world. Most of these people consider David Koresh to be a false prophet, but there are a few who believe he was a true prophet who will be resurrected on Judgment Day. Today, Mount Carmel is maintained by Pastor Charles Pace and his wife Alexa. The church relies on donations from visitors and sells David Koresh-themed merchandise to remain solvent. Um, they are conspiracy theorists who teach that George Roden allowed Bill Clinton to use Mount Carmel as a site for child and drug trafficking, and that was the reason for the siege. Um, that they believe that they had to eliminate David Koresh because he discovered evidence and he just knew too much. <clears throat> um, this event also led to several policy changes. So while the federal agents did not start the fire that killed 76 people, the outcome could have been prevented um, if this crisis was handled differently. President Clinton referred to his approval of the use of tear gas at Mount Carmel to be one of the biggest mistakes of his presidency. As a result of the lessons learned from the siege, federal agencies reorganized how they respond to these types of events to ensure that negotiators and tactical teams work together on the same page. Uh, they have taken a less threatening approach and they have more freedom to approve reasonable demands in the negotiation process. Federal agents also receive more training and specialized instruction on topics of hostage rescue, warrant execution and breaching and the use of tear gas. So now we would like to um, see if we have any questions from our students. Professor Bryant, thank you so much for that. So we do have a few student questions here. The first one is, why do you think that they agreed to play the sermon during the early days of the siege? That's a great question. Um, they were pretty clear about the reason that they wanted to play the sermon on um, national radio was because they were trying very hard to find a peaceful end to the um, conflict. They were hoping that they could get them to surrender quickly without any additional loss of life. And uh, when they actually played it over the radio, the radio explained that that was the purpose of them um, broadcasting. Thank you. OK, so we have another question here. Um, survivors of the siege at Waco, a few of them were arrested. Can you tell us more about that, why they were arrested? So they were all arrest, arrested for um, basically conspiracy to commit murder. So they were um, all part of the, the standoff, and that was the purpose of why they were arrested, is that they were all co-conspirators in the murder of the four ATF agents who were killed during the siege. Um, now, the negotiators said that that was really a very bad plan because obviously that's not going to encourage anyone to uh, want to come out of the compound and want to, to surrender if they know that they're going to be charged with murder and rest at the end. 
Um, this isn't a student question, but I have a follow up to this. Do you know how long they spent in prison for that? Um, there were a variety of sentences. Quite a few of them were dropped, but I believe the longest one might have been nine years. I would have to double check that. Okay, there was so one significant five, amount of time. time. Um, so this question is, did the ATF fully understand this group before they led the attack? Or do you feel like they were learning after the fact? They were definitely learning after the fact. So um, this group is pretty small and we might actually have, uh, I can't see who all we have present with us today, but I want to invite Chloe if she's here to chime in on this. Uh, but it's a very small offshoot, um, offshoot of the Seventh Day Adventist group. Prior to this event, very few people had ever heard of the group. And so they really would not have had very much familiarity with them when they started. And ironically, the negotiators that had less familiarity with them actually did better in negotiating with them. They did bring in another person who had quite a bit more training and background in biblical matters. And that person just ended up really having quite a few arguments with David Koresh over matters of religion and theological arguments that really wasn't the purpose of what they needed to be there for anyway. So the negotiators that had less familiarity tended to do be more successful in negotiating the release of some of the children. Why do you think that this standoff went for so long? Why did the government allow it to continue on? That's a great question. Um, so the government was wanting to use max. The, the saddest part about all of this is that the county sheriff's department had no trouble walking up and speaking to them. They had done that multiple times. Um, there were different law enforcement officers who had gone out there. The, there had been some investigations by uh, Family and Protective Services that had gone out and investigated claims of child abuse. So really, it would have been pretty easy just to go out there and to avoid all of this. Um, but the reason that it went on for so long initially was because initially the gunfight broke out because they were scared. Um, obviously, if we have if they're being um, invaded by about 100 people and there's helicopters circling around them and their their property is being breached um, they did feel very defensive at that point in time um, and that probably could have been prevented but the reason that it went on for so long was because they didn't want additional loss of life and there were profilers explaining the entire time that they needed to slow down that they needed to stop because this group would be more likely to look at mass suicide to fulfill some of these prophecies so I think this is a related question, but <clears throat> was there any responsibility taken on the part of the ATF for aspects of the raid and for the mistakes that they made? And the student also has a comment here that says it seems like the siege went a lot worse than it needed to. And I think yes. you would agree with that as well. Yes, I think everyone would probably agree with you. It, it was far worse than it needed to be. Um, some alternatives to this would be um, David Crest left the compound regularly to have dinner with small groups of people. They could have simply arrested him at that point in time and then, you know, executed this, the uh, search warrant pretty easily at that point. Um, I am not familiar with, I don't believe that any of the people involved were terminated from the ATF, but they've definitely received some, uh, quite a bit of criticism. I know there was one who was criticized in the press, an ATF agent, and he ended up committing suicide about a year later. Okay. Um, so there were some personal consequences. Um, yes. Were all of the survivors arrested? So all of the adult survivors were arrested at one point in time or another. Some of them were released pretty quickly. Some of them were not initially arrested. So some of them they held off on arresting until after they uh, were able to record family reunifications with their children. Some of the mothers whose children had left earlier were allowed to go back and play with their children and they recorded that and then they would arrest the mothers later. Um, so everyone, was, all of the adults were initially arrested, even if it was just for a shorter period of time. Why do you think that the ATF continued to fire knowing that there were women and children inside the compound? That's a great question. <laughs> It's kind of impossible to answer, isn't it? It, it is impossible to answer. Um, there's a lot of things that were not addressed well. So um, David Crush was clearly there. There were definitely some problems here. There was massive child abuse. There were issues that needed to be addressed. And I don't want to in any way negate their role in what happened. But also it really was not handled at all well by the federal authorities either. 
Um, and then this, I think, is going to be our last question because we're just about out of time. But did you watch the new Netflix show? And do you think it was well done? I thought it was very well done. I did watch it. Um, I I really liked the fact that they were able to get more of the survivor accounts. Um, the two that I had mentioned, Clive Doyle and David Thibodeau, were pretty outspoken, and they've been involved in a lot of the books and documentaries that have uh, come out since. But this documentary did such a good job of encouraging more of the survivors to share their side of the story, which I thought was excellent. That was really more survivors than I've seen out of any of the, the videos I've ever seen on, on this subject. And I just Googled it in case any other students want to go watch it. It's called uh, Waco American Apocalypse, and it's on Netflix. Yes, it's very well done. If you have access to Netflix, I would recommend it. Thank you so much, Professor Bryant, for spending this time with us today and educating us on this. I think it's especially helpful because we are going to have the 30th anniversary coming up next week. So it's always nice to have a good solid background before you start seeing it on the news and maybe seeing some, let's say, hot takes on some of this. So thank you so much for giving us a really solid historical background. Oh, all well, right, thank you all for joining us. And for students that are here for credit, I just posted the link for credit in the chat. So go there, click that link, fill out the form, uh, make sure that you completely fill it out. Specifically, I need your name, your TCC ID number, and which professor has asked you to attend. Um, that helps me get your name to your professors and helps get you credit for coming to this webinar. If um, you have any other questions, if you have anything you'd like to follow up with, Professor Bryant, do you mind sharing your contact information? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, so my email address is stacy.bryant, and that's spelled with an E. So stacy, S-T-A-C-E-Y dot Bryant, B-R-Y-A-N-T, at tccd.edu. Thank you so much. And I just put that in the chat, too, in case anybody wants it. All right, thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate it. And I hope you guys all have a great final exam experience. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.